Has your king ever won you a game of chess? Maybe it was king activity in the end game. Or perhaps your opponent played an Ansan sacrifice that you then took with your king, leading to you then being up a piece and winning the game eventually. Well, in this game, it wasn't any of that. It wasn't a drawn out end game. It wasn't a king taking any pieces. It was when English Grandmaster Nigel Short decided to march his king up the board, leading to an unstoppable checkmate. This is a crazy game, so let's get into it. So beginning the game, Short begins e4. We see knight to f6. This is known as Alakan's defense. We see e5. Of course, the knight can be attacked. You attack it. Knight moves out the way. And then d4, solidifying white's center. d6. Knight f3. This is called the modern variation because you, if you, the pawn takes, you can take back with the knight. And of course, you can't kick this knight out. This knight is very annoying because you play a move like f6. You actually lose queen h5. And of course, you might recognize this tactic. If g6, you can take that with the knight. And if pawn takes, you can take the rook in the corner. So of course, you cannot allow that. Instead, g6 was played. Fold that up with bishop to c4, kicking the knight out of the center. You don't really want to play c6 because it makes your d6 pawn a bit too weak, so the knight has to move out the way. This hits the bishop, and then bishop goes back. So bishop to g7, targeting that e5 pawn a little bit more. Queen to e2, and this just gets the queen out of the d file because sometimes when these pawns are exchanged, there's queen trades involved. Short just wants to avoid any of that. Knight to c6, castles, castles, and then h3. As a positional move, Short just doesn't want to allow any sort of bishop to g4 stuff because his pin is a bit annoying. a5, striking back on the queen side. He wants to maybe push this pawn, kick this bishop and get out of there. So we see a4, a5, a4, classic stuff, stops the pawn moving forward any further. It also gives the bishop a little hideaway on a2 if needs be. d takes e5, Jan tries to clarify the center. But after d takes e5, you can just see white has enough pieces defending that pawn. So black decides to add a piece, attacking the pawn. No, White, uh, Black decides to counter-attack one of the pieces, attacking, defending the pawn. So, but after captures, queen captures, now Black has two pieces attacking the e-pawn. White only has one piece defending it, the queen. So rookie one, redefends the pawn, and e6, blunting White's light-squared bishop. This bishop is now biting on granite. Knight d2, just preparing to get knight to f3, but it's going to defend the pawn and hit the queen. Of course, you can't take without a piece because it's defended twice by the queen and the rook. So knight d5, finally getting this bad knight into the game, wasn't doing anything on b6. Knight to f3, of course, hits the queen, hits the pawn. Queen c5, got to move the queen out of the way. And now comes the crossroads in the game. You know, how are you going, how are you going to proceed? Well, after every move your opponent makes, it makes their position not what it was. So what is now opened up? The center is a bit more open for... Yeah, for short to rotate his pieces into the game. So queen e4 puts the queen in the most active square. Queens are actually most active in the center of the board. It's just usually very risky to have them there. But in this position with how black's pieces are set up, this queen is relatively safe in the center of the board, so it's quite well centralized. Queen b4, offering a trade of queens. Bishop c4 declining, and then knight b6, hitting the bishop. So b3 defending, takes, takes, and then Timmons actually doubled white's pawns, but this is a grandmaster game. This is not 2800 dueling it out double pawns. Doesn't mean anything. I mean, these pawns still control decent squares, and the, the game is not going to be decided by these pawns. The game is going to be decided by Short's counter play on the king side, which we're going to see. Rookie A trying to develop the rook, get it in the game, sort of a more modern move, getting a rook to file that could be open later in the game. Rook d1, queen c5, just trying to get the queen off this queen side. It's not doing anything over there. Queen h4, rotating the queen towards the king side, the attack is going to commence b6 ready to finally finish his development for Yan, get his last minor piece into the game and maybe start connecting his rooks to start challenging white on the d file bishop to e3 hits the queen queen c6 bishop h6 offering a trade trade declined and short springs into the game rook d8 didn't mean to hit that twice rook d8 now if you capture short will recapture with his queen and that is actually checkmate so you cannot do that said Instead, uh, Timman decides to go bishop b7, connecting the rooks. And now it's a bit of a weird arrangement here. When have you ever seen something like this? Uh, rooks surrounded by two compatriots, but of the opposite color. So, of course, rook d1 defending. If you ever have a rook attacked in the enemy's position on like the 7th or 8th rank, just doubling up is usually one of the best ways to counteract that pressure. So, bishop g7, reoffering the trade. And then, but, but Short doesn't want to trade anymore. At that time for that's passed. He wants to take more active operations on the king. Goes rook to d7. 
Rooks on the seventh rank, they're always good. Pressure on the king, pressure on any weak pawns. Everything defended for now, but great attacking move that improves his chances on getting to that black king. So rook f8, defending that weak f7 pawn, you know. The f7 pawn was what's called a type 2 undefended piece. Defended only by the king, so it's a very weak defense. So bishop takes g7, finally the trade occurs. King takes g7, of course. Rook d Rook d4, rotating a rook into the king's side attack, and rook a e8. I mean, what is going on? It's just rooks shuffling about, but if you look at black's position, what has he got? What are these rooks looking at? I mean, this one's very passively defending, and this rook's just staring at its own pawn, which isn't even attacked. So here, short thinks he has a bit of time. So that's to bring his queen into the game, king g8, h4. We need to start cracking up on this black king. You know, obviously, in a lot of these sort of positions where the black position has a pawn on g6, h4 is almost always a good move, trying to get rid of that pawn and open up the king's last line of defense, which is those pawns. So h5, h4, h5, again, same as this side of the board, trying to stop any counterplay. The English actually kind of like this. And here, short began one of the most crazy maneuvers ever seen on the chessboard. King h2. You think, well, what is he doing? Is it a waiting move? Is he being a bit silly? Is he wanting a draw? Something like maybe repeat moving of the kings, some random waiting move. He's trying to see what unfolds. So rook c8 played. Timon doesn't really have any moves. He's sort of been Zugsfang. I mean, what's he even going to play? Maybe capture this pawn for no reason and then let this attack sort of crash through. I mean, knight g5 is looking like quite a deadly move. King g3. Short's bringing his king into the attack. You might be able to see the idea already. Rook moves, king f4. And as of this position, it is now forced checkmate for white. Unbelievable, he's bringing the king. He doesn't even have his knight in the attack. His king isn't even the last piece into the attack. His king is the second last piece into the attack and it's completely deadly. It's now forced mate. Bishop c8 played. Short saying, fine, you can take my rook. King g5. Now it's just, of course, now you can see he's threatening to go king h6 and then either mate on g7 and then mate with the queen on g7 or h7. So as he's threatening to infiltrate with his king and then mate black on g7 or h7. It's a crazy idea. And then after rook d8, Jan Timmen resigned the game because it's unstoppable checkmate. And you may be thinking, well, if uh, black just goes king h7 instead, covering the square, you're thinking, well, how is Nigel going to get his king into the game? Well, the thing is that, as I mentioned earlier, every move changes something about the position of this means that the f7 pawn is no longer defended. You can simply capture that with the rook. And after rook captures, queen captures, the king is forced to go back. And again, you can play this move queen h6, mating on either of these two squares. So black can defend one, and then gets mated in h7. It's beautiful checkmate with the two kings. Normally seen in the end game, but this time, as product of some brilliant attacking play and planning in the middle game. Maybe comment your thoughts on what you'd like to see next. Like, subscribe. I'm trying to hit a thousand subscribers by June 15th, so hopefully I can reach that goal. And if you enjoyed that, there's gonna be another video coming up now, and hopefully I'll see you guys in the next one.